This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with ice hockey coach and podcast host, Greg Reva. He discusses technology and the impact it's had on ice hockey, positionless hockey and how this has become a modern trend, as well as technical detail on how to defend counterattack. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Right, Greg, I appreciate you getting up nice and early um, to have this conversation. I know it's middle of the day-ish for me, but I know for you it's a, a quarter past seven start. But yeah, how are things in your world? Are you all good? All, all is well. You know, early starts are easy nowadays. You know, I, I got a newborn, so, uh, you know, I, I can get up on demand now. You, you give me one cry and bam, I'm, I'm out of the bed. So I, I'm ripped, ready to go. Perfect. And listen, you're a better man than I because I still struggle with the sleep side. So, uh, yeah, you, you, the fact that you're so sprightly this early in the morning, I'm, I'm glad that you're here with us and in this kind of type of form. So for people that maybe don't know you and haven't come across your work, do you want to give us a bit of an overview, I guess, of who you are and what you do? Yeah, Greg Rivak, uh, write and produce the Hockey IQ newsletter, Hockey IQ podcast. Uh, also coach high school hockey here. Um, so older kids. And then, um, I, I work with USA hockey on their adult education. So they're, they're level one, two, three, four, um, education. So it's we're called coach developers, uh, do that. And then I do some private consulting with, with players and mentoring of young coaches. It's always a gift of mine to be able to give out someone's first whistle, which is really cool. So I, I am stuck in this. My dad was a hockey president for a youth organization. So I've seen it since, I was as little as I can be, and I was always asking questions. So I, I love the whole thing of sport, and for me, it's it's my way to give back uh, to the community. And, and you know, like some people donate to charity, I, I like to donate my my time and efforts and focus uh, back in, into hockey. And the, the great life lessons that can produce are super valuable for me. And producing good people is wonderful. And then, hey, if we can throw a few wins there and, and show some enjoyment for everyone involved, uh, extra excited. Yeah, and I guess that answers my next question is uh, how did you get into to hockey? It seems like it's a, maybe a family tradition. And you've gone down that bloodline, right? Uh, so my dad picked it up. We're, he's originally from Pittsburgh. So in high school, he actually started playing. Um, the Penguins got Mario Lemieux, which, you know, that helps uh, drive some interest. But that was actually after his time. So he picked it up just when they kind of came to town. Uh, when no one really cared about hockey and pittsburgh and they just found like a, a rink that i think it was basically like a roller rink and just they had one back corner during the winter that they froze up a little bit i remember seeing some pictures like it's it's not a full rink it's just like a corner in an old shack and the shack definitely doesn't exist anymore so he picked it up and then uh, he was coaching in pittsburgh so when we moved to cleveland area uh he just wanted to be close to rink because he, he really enjoyed the sport and coaching and came to it later in life which is funny because uh, he was a shortstop and played baseball in college. Uh, I think he won all Pittsburgh tennis. I think he was like the number one tennis player. So like he was a true athlete, but he loved hockey, which he picked up later in life and wasn't as talented in. Uh, so that kind of started all of this for us. And, and then I always uh, seemed to have an affinity for it. So it stuck for me. And then lacrosse is the other sport I played. So I always said I needed a weapon in my hand. I love, I do find it amazing that the you know the multi sport athletes that you can get out in America, particularly the old age groups. As I've said on it before, it's not as uh, commonplace in England. We we specialize particularly early um, in, in majority of sports, which obviously presents a variety of different challenges. So the idea of going from you know being a good baseball player to then a good hockey player to a good lacrosse player, a good track and field athlete i still think it's amazing that people have got that capability right the way through so yeah it's, a, it's just a really interesting discussion that maybe is, is for another podcast but i do do find that fascinating um i guess for for you yourself what drew you then on to coaching so obviously you mentioned that probably in your formative years playing wise or something you do to what was the moment you realized actually coaching was going to be for you oh man uh extremely early like i always enjoyed the whole aspect that goes into coaching, the the camaraderie, the systems, the tactics. Uh, I was definitely a smarter player than I was uh, a physical freak of an athlete. Like, so I, I need help 
you know, with, with my playmaking, like that's my real specialty is ability to, to distribute the puck. So I, I probably knew when I was like a really young kid, maybe 12, where I was like, Oh, coaching is something I definitely want to get into. Um, and then just after college, when I was done playing college hockey, I knew I wanted to get back in and get back just cause, um, for me, there's a desire at the end of my career realizing, okay, th- this is the end of the line. Uh, I'm not going professional at this. Like, you know, what, what else is there out there? Um, so I, I went to the university of Akron and actually afterwards we started this program called life. You, we had 22 freshmen one year and only three returned the next year. And we did everything that they said you're supposed to do. Like, okay, tell them to go to class, make sure they're doing this. And then half of them filled out the other half, just college wasn't for them. And then, you know, various other reasons as well. Um, and it was a real eye opener where we like pounded the table and I'm like over here, literally pounding the table. Like we got to do something different, something better. So we started life. You, uh, with my fellow coach there, Matt cook. Um, and he brings in speakers now every Monday before practice. So we've got an hour session or 45 minute session, which is random speakers in life. Could be a CEO who started a company, could be a social worker. We've had, uh, veterans talk about their stories over in Afghanistan, um, and everything in between. We will do tours like we did Timken Steel uh, with one of their executives one time, checked out the big furnaces. Um, and that's been a huge success in helping prepare young men for the next stage. So like this is a very important thing to me, but also I'm not a win at all kind of cost kind of guy. Um, you know, I think the process itself produces good people and good players, and then we reap the rewards from there. No, awesome. I guess that, that kind of uh, overview, if you like, links into my next question was going to be, if if you were to describe yourself as a coach, how would you describe yourself? What what are your core values? How do you like to coach? What what are your beliefs around that space? Yeah, uh, definitely people first, uh, player second. Um, and college hockey is really cool because you have road, long road trips. You get to spend a lot of time with your players and get to know them a lot more personal. At the younger ages, you know, it's a lot tougher to get to, to know the kids. Um, you know, they have sisters, brothers, whatever it is. But I definitely want to get to know them as people, like what makes them tick. Um, that would be number one. And the second piece would be just positivity. Like if you can't transmit belief, I'm not sure what we're doing here. Like I think that's number one for coaching is being able to transmit belief you know, every, every kid has an ability to do something well. Um, they may not do a lot well, but there's something that they can do well and having them invest in that thing and be able to produce to a greater organization, a greater team, I think is super important. And having that positive outlook of trying to figure out what that is rather than trying to fix the player, I think is super important because every, every coach, when they get into it that I've mentored at least is like, you know, I'm going to fix all my players. We're going to be so good. We're going to win the championship. And I'm like, I, you should, you should just take care of your players. Like that is what I want you to just take care of your players. Don't try to transform them, take care of them. So those are the two big things for me is can we get to know them as people and, and push them forward as people and then be positive through it. And then there's all the tactics that we can dive into about keeping accountability, et cetera. And it, is there a defining moment where you realize that's what your values were or why you wanted to work in that way? Is there any particular story as to you going, okay, I'm going to place emphasis on this for this particular reason? Uh, I, I wish there was. I don't know. I'm, I'm, you can't tell. I've got some energy in me and always some fire and passion. And I've always been one that wants to see people do well, like, I always tell the story. I was in college and we're going down. I, I did all this work. I, I grabbed a puck. We're winning. I think it was by one or two goals. The other team pulls their goalie, do this work to get down the ice, chip it past a guy. And I'm, I want a breakaway, you know, by myself with an empty net, just tap it in. Um, and I actually looked behind me, saw a teammate was kind of floating there and I passed it back to him. So I passed on an empty net and uh, he was far enough behind where he was like, oh crap. Like you can see the start on this in him, his body language as he got it shot at home and then he literally grabs me as we're celebrating going back to the bench don't you ever do that to me again but yeah for me it's just i don't know it's just been a personal thing of of having energy um i do remember the day though like i was definitely a competitive kid um i do remember the day where i decided not to be angry anymore like this is ridiculous like okay go on go on tell us about this because i'm sure there's plenty of coaches and um and whatnot out there that have either been through a similar situation or have a player that's probably similar to this 
Yeah. I mean, I was just like a demanding, intense person. Um, definitely had a little bit of anger issues, but not like outwardly bad, like troublemaker. Like I, I never really got in trouble, but like definitely some internal like anger. Like I love some good screaming music when I was a kid. And I just remember it was like 15 or 16. I just woke up one day and I'm like, I'm, I'm done with it. Like, this is just too much energy. Like I can't do this anymore. So like, for example, like, I'm on the road, like I am never angry. You know, like you have to be really, really stupid to me to get angry on the road. For me, I'm like, oh, someone's speeding. Uh, you know, they're probably on the way to the hospital to visit their sick wife or grandmother, whatever it is. Um, you know, because the old joke is like everyone slower than you is an idiot. Everyone faster than you is a maniac. And for me, like I, I just the framework of people are here to try to help has been massive. And I remember 15 or 16 just that. Like it was literally one of those like wake up and change your life moments, just change your outlook, change your life. So everything for me has been pat positive, more happy go lucky type. Not being not in a naive way, but just having that mindset of like, okay, I'm gonna get screwed every once in a while, but that's a fine cost to pay for having a positive uh, outlook where it takes a lot less energy and really be able to enjoy um, myself and those around me. Uh, awesome. And so if we move it on now, I guess, to, to hockey specific, I know we, we caught up off air regarding Jim, who put me down um, your rabbit hole, I guess, in terms of trying to reach out and get you on the podcast. And he did a really good job of, of explaining, um, I guess, the, the, the pathway for, for hockey within the US. Um, do you want to, I guess, give us a real whistle stop tour of what hockey in the US looks like, just for those who haven't listened to that podcast? yet i'm going to put the yet in there to try and get some more people to go back and listen um and then i guess give us insight as to what your role is at us hockey so what what do you do there and how how does that support that pathway yeah so usa hockey is the national governing body um so they they run the national development program which is like our best kids at 16 and 17 or basically 16 17 18 so up to their draft years uh for the most part um and then they've got just overseeing the, the game and one of the big pieces in it is coach education. So that's where I come involved. I'm a coach developer within that, that department basically. So um, they have official USA hockey employees that drive the curriculum. They have a huge volunteer army of these coach developers that um, do coach education. So you start and you want to coach hockey, you've got to get USA level one then you got to get two and three and then level four. So those are like the four wrongs. You can get one per year. And with that ecosystem, guys like myself, girls like myself um, are the ones actually driving the content and actually presenting it. So it's it's a cool ecosystem of how they're driving the change within the community. Um, and it's nestled under uh, the national governing bodies, you know, your, your Olympic committees, all that. And then um, the, the curriculum itself has been helped out by the U S center for coaching excellence, which I know does international stuff as well. And, you know, all the Olympic sports, um, and Kristen Diefenbach out of West Virginia university. Uh, she's been a huge, huge help in, in driving the curriculum that we have today, which is more about how to teach, how to coach rather than the X and X's and O's. So that's the ecosystem. That's kind of how and what we do with the presentation of the content and how it's been really positive. I guess from a practical perspective, what does that actually uh, actual delivery look like? So you mentioned there being focused around, I guess, the teaching and the pedagogical side of, um, you know, helping people understand how they're going to improve, improve players rather than focus just on tech tax. So what does that look like in practice when you're delivering to these coaches to try and get them to engage with this content? Yeah, so we've got two options. One is in person. The other one is just over Zoom. So you can sign up either way, whatever works for your schedule. Like adults are busy, you know, like we got a million things going on. So I, I find Zoom is even as a presenter to be the easiest unless uh, the in-person is here local um, rather than having to travel to a different city. Uh, but with the things themselves, you know, there's a big difference between kid education and adult education, like with the youth and the kids, um, you got to push a lot of stuff. Like they don't have a lot of life experience like an adult does. So they need a little more background, a little more oomph with it. Um, we, we call it push, you need to like push information to them. You just, they don't have as much. Um, on the flip side with adult education, there's a lot of life experiences there. So like, how can we pull all of these people together that have these life experiences and gather some knowledge from them, but also we need to see a performance. 
So how can we guide them on the path? Because everyone starts at a different place. You know, like teachers probably have a good grasp of all of this. Like we, we just changed the word coach to teach or from teach to coach in a lot of this stuff. So like they, they're going to be much further along. So how do we, as you know, wide ranging adults help push it forward? And, you know, you try to get them in reflective states. You're asking questions. You're showing them clips. What do you think on this? And it's really a conversation as a group. And you're just trying to pull out the right terms and the right key, I call them neon words, like key neon words that help drive what you're actually wanting to present. So we're always presenting the same stuff, but it's a new group, a new discussion every single time. And it's super fascinating to see what people come up with. And a lot of times someone will ask a question and uh, I won't even answer it, even though I'm like with USA Hockey and like the authority figure of sorts, I just think, oh, is anyone else in this group dealt with this? I would say maybe once I haven't seen someone like peep up, but everyone in that room is like trying to help each other. And it's like this collective group, which at first, if you haven't gone through that kind of system before is super awkward and people are like really hesitant to talk, but then once it gets going, um, it, it's, it's really fun for myself, even as a presenter. And then also the people in the room, like there's been a lot of good feedback on feeling involved, feeling valued. Um, and just the, the system of being able to pull information and life experiences from all of these people and, you know, they're coming from all over the country if they're on Zoom, which is, I think, really fascinating. So what works for someone over in California versus New York, Florida, Ohio, it's really, really cool stuff. And I guess it's nice learning opportunity for you as well, right? That like you're speaking to people, as you mentioned, probably in cultures or environments that you've never coached in or might never coach in. So the opportunity to learn from them and go, actually, that's a really good point. I can take that and use that on little Timmy that I'm going to be coaching on Friday night. It's a really opportunity for you to as, as horrible as it sounds, be a little bit selfish and go, actually, I'm going to take a little bit of your information and use it as well. Yeah. Every, everyone's a learning opportunity, right? Like whether you like it or disagree, like, you know, steal from people you like, do the exact opposite of people you don't like. like I have my mentors and I have my anti-mentors. Like if one of my anti-mentors starts doing something, I, I'm probably going the exact opposite every single time, which is, you know, still a learning opportunity. So le learning from a lot of these people who it has been great. And then, you know, it kind of feeds the podcast as well. All these conversations they will have and concepts. And I think selfishly, like it's definitely helped me go to the forefront of where we're starting to push. You know, I don't like using the big words. I'm just going to say like the actual coaching, not, you know, pedagogy and environments, but like taking everything I can learning, having these conversations with, with people like yourself um, is super helpful. And just being able to talk through and think through, and make it actually actionable to my specific environment. Um, I mean, it's definitely helped one with my coaching, but you know, any type of relationship has been super helpful. All of this stuff, like rather than telling people how to do it, asking a good question gets, a, gets a lot better response. Uh, you know, like telling your wife, like you need to blank is probably a bad option. Asking like, what do you think? Should we do this? A lot better, a lot better. So even like little details like that, uh, super, super helpful in many facets of life. And I guess it's something you can use towards the kids as well, right? So that you, you can use those techniques on the adults, but then, you know, that's the way we want to question the kids rather than saying you're not doing that. It's a case of, do we think that's the most effective way of doing it? Or is there a better way? Or can you show me a way that might include your teammates? And it just allows, I guess, the practicing of that of that question. Moving on, I guess, slightly to, to the, the um, playing side, etc. I guess there's been a bit of an evolution from speaking to Jim in hockey over the last, you know, 20, 30 years in terms of the game itself and how, how it's played. From your perspective, what have you seen evolve um, and what bits, I guess, really stand out to you at the moment as being really important to teach players early on to give them an opportunity to progress further down the pathway? The, the technology has been massive. I mean, with a hockey stick these days, it's unbelievable. Uh, you used to have what they call two-piece sticks. Like you have one part blade, one part shaft, and like you'd have to glue them together, which, you know, half the time after a while, it gets a little jangity and uh, jarred. Uh, like I remember Wayne Gretzky used to use an aluminum stick. Like what? Nowadays, it's these, you know, carbon fiber, like you see in F1, it flexes like unbelievable. So like that's played a big role um, one, the second piece, um, is just the playing standards and rules. Like the rule book is way more enforced today, massively. Like there's a lot less grabbing and holding. 
you can see a lot more uh, skilled players being able to survive in the environment. So that, that's been a massive thing for hockey. So it used to be, they called it the clutch and grab era. Like that was the way of safety. It's like, oh, we're slowing the, the speed down by clutching and grabbing. And nowadays, like completely taken out. You've got unbelievable amounts of speed. Um, safety is actually way better because uh, you don't know, like grabbing, being grabbed by one guy and being hit by another, which more often than not, like everyone thinks concussions of like big hits. It's really usually unexpected contact that creates uh, concussions either that or a complete blow to the head, but like it's unbelievable how the sports change. So those are like two overarching things is, is just calling a rule book and allowing or everyone to really be able to participate regardless of, of true size, obviously stronger, faster equals better most of the times, but that's been massive. And, and just um, the next piece being like how do coaches deploy from X's and O's. Like it used to be very, very rigid. Like defensemen, you stay back and you guard the net and you don't get involved in the offense much. Like you pass the pucks to the forwards. Forwards, you go score, play enough defense, and then, you know, we'll go from there. But nowadays, there's so much interchange. You're seeing defensemen that used to stay back. They're being encouraged now to jump up. So for for me, um, I love it because I think just the, the, the need to read off – teammates is great in life is great in sport and I, that's basically what i work on when i, I get the kids because you know young, young adults are very selfish like how do you get them to be empathetic to their teammates and how do you get them to work together so that's like the big tactical piece is you'll see now as defensemen are all over the place where traditionally they would have never you're seeing the deployment of people in positional interchange and how that all operates as being a massive difference. And it's really been allowed by actually calling the rule book. You don't need these big brawny defensemen, you know, skating is, is so much more important now. And does that change the skills that you're teaching? Um, I guess at the, at the younger age groups is from, from what you're saying there, if you're allowing different body types to come involved in the game, um, if I, if I look at it in like a, a football perspective, it allowed, I guess, more skillful players to then be able to get 1v1 opportunities, which means you're probably teaching dribbling a little bit more than you were doing previously or, you know, one twos or particular types of passes that are going to be able to exploit that. Whereas in previous years gone by, if anyone takes too many touches, they're getting a, a knee-high challenge and potentially end a career, which isn't ideal. So, yeah, does that and has that changed the type of skills and techniques that you're seeing more often at the top level and therefore teaching as part of the pathway? Uh, skill has definitely been a m much more... Like, you, you just don't see coaches. It used to be like, everyone hit everything. You know, you just don't see that anymore. So there's a lot more skill all around the board, uh, for sure. Like, the, the things the kids are pulling off today, like, like even with the technology, it's just unimaginable <laughs> 15 years ago. Um, but the, the, that's been the focus in, in North America is to kind of go towards that European, like skill, skill, skill. So we've kind of lost the art of the physicality a little bit. Obviously it's as its place and especially at the highest level, but it's no longer hitting in contact within like separating head from body. It's more of separating puck from player, which is a great, great thing. Um, and it requires a lot more like figuring out body leverage. So the, the, you're seeing a lot more work on what we call competitive contact you know, angling is another one where you have to force them into it. spaces like skating is, is the massive bogey, right? Like skating forces so much, like once you kind of commit to a direction, it's hard to change to another direction. And if you don't have a good base, it's really hard. Like skating coaches, um, you know, like you, you really want to bring your players base in underneath them. A lot of times if they get too wide, they're stuck on their inside edges because you got inside edges and outside edges. And if you get stuck now, you've got to like move to move. So like skate skating is a big thing. So when you're thinking about like what kind of skills you're teaching, um, you know, it depends on what level you are, but a lot of it now is you, we, we understand the majority are in like the do no harm type of stage of career coaching. Like try not to teach too much and be involved too much because realistically you don't know enough, don't understand enough. So that's where you start. And then you can start to evolve beyond that of like, what do we actually need to do? Like, do we understand that we need to bring a player's skating base underneath them so they can access both edges? 
and they can really react and be able to what they call the four way mobility, you know, up, back, side to side. So for, for skills, it's, it's much more skills for skills sake, but also within context is, is where hockey is currently going. Cause it used to be skill, 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 and they could practice it really well. And then it doesn't translate well to the game and it's figuring out ways that we can actually translate and, for, you know, bring that repetition without repetitiveness uh, to the forefront of practice. I know I'm going to go a little bit chicken or the egg question here. What, what would normally come first? Would it be a lot of skating and trying to get people to understand their body and ability to move off edges? Or would it normally be stick and puck related where you're trying to get them to be able to maneuver, maneuver the puck? Cause I'd imagine particularly at the real dot ages, probably doing both of those things can be challenging. And I'm talking from personal experience cause I didn't do a lot of ice skating and I'm, like Bambi on ice. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's super tough. Um the, the current raging debate in ice hockey that is uh maybe in its infancy and I will definitely pick up steam um is around like what they used to call power skating. Like you'd see like three lines at the end of a rink and then you'd go down maybe access the movement pattern two, three times. And then someone would talk to you for like two minutes and like, here, we got to try this. And they demonstrate and explain. And half the time they're explaining away from you and you really can't hear it that well. And you go back, do another two or three. And like, is that really the best way to coach hockey? So one, it's like, do we use lines? How do we use that? Um, and then the second piece is just around the puck. Like there's so many times, like you see a player, phenomenal skater, throw a puck in, they look like Bambi again. So this idea of like puck centric skating, where it needs to be in relationship to the puck, like how do we skate in relation to the puck? So that that's the actually the next item. But when you're looking at the younger age, I mean, just keep moving. Like that's the key item, like skating and stick handling are one and the same. And like, until you can like skate and stick handle good enough to pick your head up, uh, it doesn't really matter. You just try to develop those skills as fast as humanly possible. Um, but it, yeah just keep moving at that point and just let it naturally flow like we don't we don't need to try to get te- super technical on skating and stick handling when they're at the stage of like mimicking like they can't form the full like concept in their head quite yet so keep them moving keep them watching people maybe show some examples things like that are, are super important at the younger ages and so linking back to what you said around the leverage piece can you just talk us through i guess what some of the technical detail is around trying to regain uh the puck from someone rather than knocking their head off because i think this is a really interesting piece particularly when i look at uh, soccer for example people are now trying to manipulate their body to get it in between man and ball often so yeah if you could just explain i guess what you mean by that one and, and then contextualize it of, of how players look to do that and maybe some p- specific tactics that people might use an area of the the ice to help them either locate other defenders to support or go towards boards to support in that space all right i'm going to answer the first question and then you'll probably have to remind me of the second one maybe the link in the other we'll find out um but the the, the big idea here is what i kind of call like position before possession like we're trying to control space and own it so then we can pick up the puck so rather than going in and trying to separate someone we're trying to get that space now with the stick um you know you're getting under the stick creating driving through hands if you can get your hips in front even better it's where we can create this like exclusive space that only we can really get to um that's number one contact is all within relationship to the puck like any kind of like late hit is a big no-no now so making sure that we're finding ways to get stick on puck kind of like get leverage get your hands drive hips through hands get the stick lift all of these things uh because that's a big difference like with with hockey you have to not just worry about the other player but you also have to worry about their stick and i think that's where some of the elite talents that we're seeing that are really good in this area of like getting pucks back. Like they're, they're doing stick swats and then they're driving their hips through your hands or like within that, what we call a triangle between the stick and the two toe caps. Like that's that triangle space and trying to drive through there um, to just separate the puck. And, and like a really good thing to look at is even just within hockey itself, like sled hockey or women's hockey, like women's hockey has no checking sled hockey has no checking, but their blades massively long. It's like, they can't stop on a dime like you can with a normal athlete with two feet and 
shorter blades. It's like how they angle and how they separate. It's, it's really fascinating. And the same with like women's hockey, like you can't actually hit. So how do you successfully remove the puck? So it's all about using that tool, the to stick to go stick on puck, try to get a little knock on it or a little tick as I call it. And then if you can get in close enough and truly battle, you know, finding the, the separation within that triangle space. So you're able to separate their ability to use their stick to actually control the puck. And then I guess you're looking at a transition piece after that, right? You're looking at then, can you either release the putt to a teammate or can you turn and break the other way from them? So there's an element of actually, rather than just slamming someone into a board, if we're able to separate the puck from someone and then escape, we're in a position to then allow us to potentially create an overload going down the other other end of the ice. Yeah, absolutely. Like the ability to make the next play is where the best minds in hockey are going because everyone knows getting the puck back and stopping movement on defense is vital, but then you got to think about like, what's next, you know, and that's constantly the, the question of like how we should is like, is this a good tactic? Yay or nay? Like sliding in hockey is an interesting one, right? We're going to leave our skates, dive down and just try to like block space on the ice. Like that's great. And sometimes it works and maybe that's the right solution more often than not now you're sliding all the way into the corner and you're completely out of the play it's like what's next what are we going to do like maybe we need to find a different solution which you know forward angling and what we call surfing and hockey is getting more and more prevalent where we're actually defending via skating forward we're closing gaps we're we're getting into the the space of the opponent earlier um, which is kind of interesting because it's kind of like the opposite of, of soccer in in a way, because soccer's gone so much to zonal stuff where now players are just understanding like pockets of space. Um, and there used to be a lot of zone in hockey and now a lot of it's man to man. And now you got to understand like, what are the tactics to break that down? Sorry, can you explain? Because I think this is gonna be a really interesting point. Can you explain that to me? You mentioned like being in a, in a surface pose or something like that. Yeah, explain to me what you mean by that. Uh, like the the zonal versus man coverage type stuff. Am I, am I understanding this right? I just want to make sure you get the correct question. Sorry, right. you, no. You mentioned something there around when you're defending in a, in a one v one situation or defending about like being in a surfer's position or something like that. And I assume it's in reference to body shape type movements. And you you said about getting out to them and into their space earlier. Oh, surfing. So okay, so yeah. surfing is like so the 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 normal thing you would think of like. In, in hockey is you defend skating backwards. You're skating backwards and you're just kind of mirroring the play. Um, surfing is is more of like, rather than the player coming to you, you're going to go and hunt them actively. So it'd be like uh, a press in soccer, for example, like that first person goes and presses. Well, you'd think about this would just be like a press, but it would be the second or third layer where you're going man to man and you're sticking with that player or you're, um, it's basically like the weak side defenseman will surf or skate forward into a player on the opposite side of the ice, taking away that time and space and being able to better do it than the strong side defenseman, push them to the outside, match speed uh, without getting burned or having to worry about like getting the puck chip behind you, that kind of stuff. You're, you're just taking rather than them playing you, you're playing them. Like that's the kind of the mindset is like, you're finding ways to attack and be the aggressor and dictate the situation rather than just taking the rush and skating backwards and finding ways to get into that earlier, which leads to like, okay, now we need to find a solution for the offense. Like the defense is starting to get the better of that in, in ice hockey. Um, for me, I'm, I'm focusing on like, how do we undo that? Which I, I think might be a competitive edge for where we're going next. That's really interesting. Again, uh, that, apologies. That's a, probably an ice hockey town I wasn't aware of, but I think, yeah, that's a really interesting principle because in football, we would say that, what you're talking about there regarding skating backwards and not engaging is is not a cardinal sin, but it'd be up there, particularly when you're in and around your own goal because they're driving you closer and closer to your goal and creating opportunities. So we would, you know, I remember even when I was a kid about blocking crosses, they'd want you to get out and try and block crosses and not go into your own box. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting that that's the kind of a shift you've made now in terms of maybe not doing that from a body shape perspective. Is there any value in terms of how you do that? Because I imagine, obviously, you're allowed to make some contact. I know it's not crazy after hits and stuff, but I imagine you're allowed to make a little bit of contact to give you an opportunity to turn. Is it a very square, make yourself as big as possible type deal? Or is it a situation where you're trying to force play in particular areas of the ice? 
Yeah, I mean, it's always a fight for space, right? And the higher levels you go, the the better you are at controlling that space. Um, from when it comes from body shapes, so you've got to like the surfing, like you're going to make some contact and like just force them to go around you. Uh, especially if you're giving your, your defensive partner is probably going to be doing the next play, give them more time and space to make that play. And then if you're the one skating backwards and you're thinking about like pivoting, like this is the most common issue you see with hockey defense, like they don't understand the details within pivoting, like that puck gets laid behind you. Like there's a chip puck and you've got to turn and go for a race or that player is, is going by you, like the, the proper pivot is to go with the player. Like you don't want to follow the puck. So like, for example, the boards, it's very, you know, it's the thing in hockey. You can bounce it off the boards and then it'll end up on the other side. So your goal is to really just turn with that offensive player, get in their space, which creates more time uh, either for yourself or your teammates to make that play. And you're again, trying to control it as much as possible, control the space, control the situation, control the opponent. Um, and, and allow yourself to truly come up with, you know, the most amount of like advantages that you possibly can. So you can make that next play, your teammate can make that next play. So body orientation, if you're just backing up, skating backwards and pivoting is always into that player, get a little rub, get into their line, try to again, get that, that position or positioning before we get possession, whether it be yourself or your teammate. And have you seen a shift in, players or player types that are able to perform this so i'd imagine it's a very different technique if you're just skating backwards trying to delay um and then making uh the right decision of when you're going to try and engage and, and fight for that space whereas if you're trying to be more aggressive and you're going to be on the the front i'd normally say front foot but front skate if you're going to be on the front skate and you're going to try and uh you know win the puck back higher or put them under pressure to force mistakes you're probably going to have different body types and different skating ability of what they're able to do because you're going to need people that are able to you know, change directions particularly quickly that are going to be able to accel and decel quickly and um, I guess potentially change the type of attacking players you're looking at because if you're going from an area where era where people were just focus purely on scoring goals and you've got two brutes behind you and it's their job to stop them to now actually you're a integral part of our pressing style of hockey and in order to regain the ball that might potentially change what you're looking for and the physicality or the type of profile you're looking for in in a attacker as well yeah mobility has definitely become the the name of the game like you would maybe see 10 defensemen in the entire nhl that were sub six foot you know now you can find that entire division (laughs) Like there's probably four times as many of those, like, uh, you know, the size for size sake is no longer a thing. Like there needs to be a mobility component to it and management and players, especially at the, at the elite level, understand the value of all of these things and are slowly but surely getting more and more of these types of players because it filters down. So there's more available to them that can play this type of style, which is super fascinating. Like, you know, there's an inspiration at the high level and then it filters down to, you know, the average Joes and the elite hockey players. So then now you have more of those available because, you know, like you think about soccer, a lot of it, you're just developing your own players. Like in the NHL, you, their teams are drafting. And so they're, you know, what's the available talent pool and what's going to work and like, what is the skill set where we're going and understanding that can be super vital for, for scouting and then just player development. Yeah. And no, I, I, the draft system is a fascinating one in terms of, you know, I guess in the youth ranks, if you're working at trying to get people to that next level, you have to be reactionary to what is going ahead. Whereas in in soccer, because you've got academies, you can stick to your style of play. So, you know, if we, if I play in a team that we do just want big defensemen that are going to go around thumping into everyone, um, then we can keep producing that. Whereas, I guess, in the US, actually, if you're trying to, if you're a college program that's trying to support people to make that next step, you need to make them suitable for the masses rather than one particular side yeah like you're developing skill set that is more universal or what is available to you like you know the uh, maybe the smaller teams in college hockey play a completely different style than the higher level ones because they're just like the available talent pool um we're fortunately having such growth and there haven't been an expansion of uh teams so like there's a lot more talent available to play this type of style 
in the past, which was just was not not really there. We're not really encouraged as you go up, you know, you were looking for the big thump in defense. And like, I, I think of uh, some defense that were cut tracked in the early 2000s that they, they're in the first round, like, you know, you're putting your franchise on the line a little bit for them and their skill set was going bye-bye real fast. And, you know, how stupid that looks from the management teams now when those players just couldn't survive anymore, given the rule changes and calling the rule book. No, it's, it's crazy. And I guess how do, from attacker's perspective, how do you, um, I guess, one, adapt to this new style in terms of like how defending the people are going to counteract? So from a strategic point of view, what do you look to do that? And also, how has it changed um, from those that are trying to exhibit skills? So if you're looking at, um, I, I think I read a stat the other day that said the number of slap shots that had been taking place in the NHL had vastly reduced just because of the style of this play and stuff. I don't know if it was you that put it out or someone else. I, I, think, I think it was. I just, yeah, I just put it out two days ago or three days uh, ago. Okay. So yeah, it, it, I'm glad that I'd done a little bit of research on it, but yeah, I thought that was a fascinating piece in terms of, you know, even when I played NHL on my PS two or ps3 at the time that was the bit that i would enjoy is rotating it around and getting it back to the other person and just trying to smack it as loud as i can i guess from a skill perspective and strategy perspective that then changes what you're actually asking your players to do um because they might not need that as a necessary skill as they would have done 10 years ago yeah, and I'll point back to the technology being a huge piece of that as well. Like your, these sticks, they flex, and you can get so much power. Like the number one overall draft pick, like one, of, and you know he's looking to be a generational talent. He's five foot nine, but he is one of the best shots that you'll see in the entire world. Um, so technology is a big thing. Um, going back to the kind of that first piece of like how are attackers adjusting? I mean, like you have to understand attacking space behind so much more now because you're not getting the space in front. So like used to be having to understand the in front how do you attack that space now it's a lot more getting behind defensemen because it's so congested it's so down your throat non-stop so like from a tactical and tactical how do you get there like do you chip pucks to yourself to teammates you know if you're off the puck where are you skating to it's so like that's massive and then um from like just like angling and skating like and then the surfing with with skating, you kind of get locked into a track. So it's super hard to completely change. It's like one of the great things of like, if someone's trying to angle you, like skate straight at them, like it's super hard. It just locks in their feet and it really makes them immobile where you make one fake They're If they follow for that, they're going one whole other direction and you're, you know, whole another stratosphere this direction, which is uh, one of the tactics and then just spotting pucks, the spaces that you're able to get to first. Uh, and yeah, skating drives so much in hockey of like available availability. I mean, playing off the heels is a great concept in soccer, even like where you pass, like someone's going this direction, you pass off the heels, the other like hockey, it's so much more dramatic of how amazing and useful that is. Uh, so that would be a massive thing. And then, uh, you know, slap shots again, back to technology, don't really take it. Like you can just rip a puck with the the new technology of the, the sticks. It's, quite quite remarkable but i think that's a really that's a really cool innovation right like that's something that years ago probably wouldn't have even been considered but actually the way technology is adapted is then allowing to innovation innovation within the game because it's not necessary to pick up the speed because you can do it anyway and then linking to your point around the body shape thing i think that's a really interesting one in in football we we discuss quite a lot like that double movement piece of where you're able to um if I'm trying to get a ball to feet is run, pretend that I'm going to run beyond and then do that for three yards to get the defender to drop to then come back in to play feet. I guess you can't necessarily do that in a hockey space purely because changing directions are a little bit more challenging. But in terms of looking at like driving directly at someone's body to then be able to change direction or um, like you mentioned, playing off heels, how would you actually work on those types of techniques with players in, in session? What type of thing would you deliver to allow them to get practice at doing those types of things? Um, playing off heels is an interesting one <clears throat> because you've got the on puck versus the off puck. So it's really a concept. Um and you can kind of show players like, right. Like we guide focus in practice. Like that's what we do as coaches is like, how do you guide that focus? Like one of the things I love to do is just show like you actually pass behind a player, you pass it off the boards. It actually ricochets slightly more forwards. 
So you can play a pass to someone, even though they may be like normally what you'd call it covered or they'd have to come back to the ball, but you can actually send them in for a breakaway. So like, how do you show focus? Um, or like if you're breaking down, like a, what we call an odd man rush, so you have three attackers, two defenders, how do you approach that? And, you know, the, the F2, the person who no, you normally used to drive the net nowadays is driving off the, the near side defender's heels. So they're trying to make a stick pick. If they can, they can control the defender's stick. So that it gives more space for the puck carrier and you're driving off the heels. And that's where the pass would be made. If that player ever steps up on the puck uh, carrier, you're laying it into that space um, or you're, you're looking to kind of like edge towards the middle, get off the wall, like 80% of the puck touches start on the wall. So if you get off the wall and see how the attacker's angles are, I mean, that that's super important is to understand like what kind of angles are available from passing or skating and just seeing who's off and who's on and then being able to play around that. Um, Cause if someone angles you well, like it's unbelievably difficult to play. Like you're pretty much, you're, you're pretty much screwed. There's, there's not much you can do there other than like play it to a teammate. So you need a lot more help. Um, but if you, if you're someone who understands the, stand spatial awareness and angles really well um you know it's super beneficial on both sides of the puck uh, obviously this is challenging in hockey because there's no like offside rule in terms of when you're on those breakaways and you're deeper into the uh into a zone for example or into the, the final attack in third um but one of the principles that's come out in football recently and has probably been highlighted mainly over the last like, 18 months or so, I'd say, um, and I found it via a former guest called jo- Josh uh, Bednash on Twitter, about if you're on a 3v2 breakaway where someone's trying to, um, obviously, they're, eventually they're trying to use the extra man, is basically showing them inside. So showing both, if, if you've got the middle person of the ball that's uh, or the puck that's attacking, and we've got one to his left and one to his right, the two defenders angle their body shapes to encourage him towards the goal or encourage her towards the goal. Basically working on the principle rather than them being able to rotate the puck or ball and end up where they can play it across for someone to tap it in, you're signifying to the uh, goalkeeper that we're going to keep the puck in the middle, so prepare that there's going to be a shot from there. And as he gets closer and closer to the goal, we're going to then begin to narrow off, narrow off, narrow off to hopefully maybe get a block. But it basically forces everyone to know what the outcome is going to be rather than it being um, rotational or subjective from point to point. And yeah, it's it's something that some of the braver teams are, are given a go at the top level of soccer just to see whether it's a more effective way to defend against overloads and counterattacks. Yeah, and ice hockey um, this is just prominent on the, like two one two v one attacks. Um, obviously, <laughs> we're not playing eleven v eleven, so usually it's three v two or two v one. Those are the most common. So, like, uh, you know, you, you have to decide how you're going to play that. And with analytics coming out and being more prevalent, like everyone understands that giving the shooter to the goalie is probably our best opportunity as long as it's not a straight up breakaway. So how yeah. can we do that? And then allows us as, or allows the goalies to simply just focus on that cutting down the angle, like coming out further. So there's less to shoot at or around. And then you just take away the pass so that they don't have that movement, which is super challenging for the goalie anyway. So like, that's a, a massive thing in ice hockey. Um, pretty universal now that you give the, the shooter, to the goalie um, and then try to, you know, not make it a complete break where they can just sneak around the goalie and then or make it like one fake shot and go around. Uh, so like, that's, that's super important. Um, I, I think it's fascinating how players are on the opposite side, like counteracting that, which is their routes to the net. So rather than going straight and skating at the goalie, like you're actually going either like kind of across their body or down towards the goal line. So it's a, it's a harsh, like 90 degree angle, rather than going straight to goalie, you're going opposite. So now that they have to worry about different axes, because it's really hard to shoot on a goalie that you're going straight at, like they kind of have the angle, they have the advantage. So you're making a push to a different space that they have to change their, their, their movement and their footwork and their axes, like body orientation. Um, I call them like the three axes of goalie, like depth, which is how far you're out squareness, which is like your shoulders to puck. Like how does that in relationship to the goalpost? Um, and then uh forget the other one right off the top of my head here, but basically the ability to, to stand uh, uh flat to a puck where you may have to change if that player's skating down to the goal line. So like your route into the shot is super, super important and valuable. 
uh, from an attacking standpoint. If you're the one that's consistently getting uh, this position where the shooter goes to the goalie from a defensive standpoint. Yeah, that sounds something that I'm going to need to a little bit more digging on because I think that actually, from a attacking point of view, similar to what you're saying there, the type of movements that players are adopting to counteract that then changes slightly. And there's a lot of different ones. One maybe bit for you is um individual called Marcelo Bielsa, who's former... Uh, former Leeds man. Yeah, yeah. And so he he's obviously like the godfather of a lot of football, but some of his principles in terms of movements to get attackers in and around the goal was really interested. And he actually counteracted it with Patrick Bamford, um, a really interesting game I watched. I want to say maybe against Chelsea or Man United or something like that where Patrick Bamford basically went, okay, if you're going to offer me that space, I'm going to run directly through the middle of you and look to receive the ball. And you could see both the defenders getting really etchy of the fact that actually if he receives the ball in that space, he's then in a 1v1 with the goalkeeper and it allows him more uh, abilities to negotiate that the angles you're talking about at a much closer distance that then becomes really hard to deal with. So, um, yeah, it might, might be one for you to have a look at in terms of that because there's some really interesting principles of what he's done there. But I'm conscious of time and obviously you... I, I, to... I'm super into European soccer. Um, like U, US soccer really stunk for a lot of time and I'm like, <laughs> bad soccer, there's not much worse than that. But good soccer, there's not much better than that. So like, European soccer has always been a passion of mine. So I, I love studying those guys. I mean, you go back to Pep. Um, oh, oh. The slew of coaches coming out of uh, the Netherlands, Johan Cruyff, all that. Uh, big, big fan. Arsene Wenger is my guy. Still love, love that gentleman. Um, you know the professor, so he's definitely been a, a big influence on, on how I try to approach uh, player development and you know giving opportunities to young people. Yeah, no, and as I said, and Jim said this uh, in, in the previous podcast, and I think we've highlighted it here. It's because of the nature of hockey and football, there's a lot of transferability in terms of some of the techniques and stuff. And that's why I wanted to do a deep dive into that body shape piece, because actually I think that's a really interesting principle of you know, discussing people's body shapes and whatnot. And that's transferable to to you know how I'd coach. So like we said before, a little bit from a little bit from a selfish point of view, I'm going, actually, how can I teach my kids to pass back foot or on heels and ways to protect the ball if they are becoming under pressure so um, yeah, body orientation is a weird one with ice hockey um i mean there's a there's a definitely an element of that but the way that you, you kind of like route yourself around the rink opens up a lot of things like how you route opens up your body orientation to things rather than have to orient yourself within the space it's like there's an interesting piece with that like um like the, there, there's going to be a scanning project that comes out and I can't give them any more details. It's supposed to be out any any day now, but um, currently can't give that away. But they're going to look at like scanning within hockey. And one of the difficulties that I've highlighted and talked about with some of the researchers is just like, how do people go around the rink? So like when they naturally look up based on their routing, they're seeing the most amount of ice. So like they're like scanning without like moving their head and like you'd see a normal scanning type thing. So that, that'll be interesting to see how that operates. But th you're right. There's so much transferability. Like hockey, I think, is just sped up soccer <laughs> because yeah. the, the space is so much smaller and you get a lot more speed on skates once you get going. So I, I, it'll be curious to see where we go with that because um, obviously collecting information is the, the lifeblood of any elite performer. Yeah, for sure. And I'm conscious of time of what, of what we allotted for this and there's loads that I haven't even discussed with you. I wanted to talk about how you manage the, the team versus the individual because hockey inherently because you you know you're so close to goals and um loads of other bits so it might be a conversation for another day that we can catch up on another time later down the line but last question for this podcast um which is if i were to speak to either the people that you work with from a coach development perspective or any of your players how would you hope they described you in three words and why uh Words. I don't know. I, mean, I, I can give little sentences. Uh, best interested at heart. Uh, positive and smiling. Uh, that, I don't know how like, how how to write phrase this, but it's it's not like a hard ass, but also like keeps me accountable to details. You no, know, like knowing that I've got the best in interest, and it's beyond just you know goals and assists. I, I'm gonna uh, put that down as caring but challenging. 
we'll put it yes, down there. Carrying the challenge. That's much yeah. See, I'm glad I got you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, listen, Greg, really appreciate your your early morning time. And as I said, loads of bits that we, we could go into again at a later date. But yeah, thank you so much for your time and hopefully we can do this again. Uh yeah, I'm in. Just tell me when and where. Awesome. Right. Catch up with you soon. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.